We take up our study of the Westminster Confession of Faith with chapter 13 of sanctification. And since certainly one of the major means of sanctification is prayer, perhaps we should begin our study at that point. Heavenly Father, Thou who alone by Thy Word and Spirit and by the various means of grace doth enable us to die more and more to sin and live in more and more unto righteousness, we do invoke Thy presence now, that as we consider and study together the way by which we become more like Him who loved us and gave Himself for us, we pray that Thou will help us to understand and above all to love the life in Christ and to grow in grace and in the knowledge of Jesus for His name's sake. Amen. You remember in our last study, in the Westminster Confession, we noticed how a person is brought out of death, spiritual death, into life by what is called in chapter 10, effectual calling. And that that work of regeneration in our hearts produces faith, which brings us to Jesus Christ, in whom alone we are justified. That justification has as its sequel our adoption into the family of God, so that without presumption we may call God by the familiar term, Abba, Father. We don't presume because He Himself has extended His scepter of divine forgiveness. He has clothed us in the righteous robes of His Son, Jesus, and we are, because of Jesus, acceptable in Him, and truly, by divine grace, forever, the children of God. At the same time that all that is so, we in our actual lives are far from the image of our Savior. And yet He has started to reproduce in us the likeness of God in which we were originally created. And that is what chapter 13 of sanctification is dealing with. It's sometimes been po popularly defined as the Christianizing of the Christian. And the Catechism's way of describing it as dying more and more to sin and living more and more to righteousness. But now let's give attention to the way the Westminster Confession states it in three propositions. Section 1 reads this way. They who are effectually called and regenerated, having a new heart and a new spirit created in them, are further sanctified really and personally through the virtue of Christ's death and resurrection, by His Word and Spirit dwelling in them. The dominion of the whole body of sin is destroyed, and the several rusts, lusts thereof are more and more weakened and mortified, and they more and more quickened and strengthened in all saving graces, to the practice of true holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. You notice that last expression especially? To the practice of true holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. You see, we have a true holiness imputed to us, as was seen in chapter 11, by justification. The imputation of Christ's true holiness or righteousness becomes ours, and we are accepted in Him. But what sanctification is doing is leading us to the practice of that true holiness. And without both the imputation, and as has sometimes been said, the impartation of true holiness, we will never be truly acceptable and fully so in God's presence. So God, through Christ, begins a work of restoration in us. Remember, we were created originally in His image. That image was totally effaced, not merely defaced. It was, morally speaking, totally effaced by the fall. It is restored by justification, and the very practicing holiness is also produced in us by sanctification. As is said here, the dominion of sin is destroyed. Notice it doesn't say sin is destroyed. The guilt of sin is destroyed. We better recognize that. The guilt of sin is destroyed in justification. The power of sin is not destroyed, but broken in sanctification. But remember, the way the 
confession puts it is, the dominion of sin is broken. Not the presence of sin, not the power of sin, not the reality of sin in the Christian heart, but its absolute domination over man. That is what's destroyed in sanctification. As John Murray, one of the finest theologians of the 20th century, has put it, sin remains, but it no longer reigns. That's the spirit of the Westminster Confession, just as John Murray was a practically perfect copy, not only of the teaching of Westminster, but also the very principles and practice of what it taught. Sin remains, according to chapter 13, but it doesn't reign anymore. Its dominion has been broken. Let me remind you once again, in that great chapter 9 on the fall of man, remember he was totally disinclined to virtue and totally inclined to vice. Sin had absolute mastery over him. The thoughts and intents of his heart were only evil continually, said Genesis. And Paul, echoing that, says, there's none that doeth good, no, not one. And before chapter 3 of Romans is finished, it's not only that there's no one who does good, but no one who does one good thing his entire life. As I say, when he does a thing that's good, it's only outwardly so. It never touches his heart, and it's therefore a bad, good work. But a fallen man does nothing but bad, bad works or bad, good works his entire life because sin has complete mastery over him. And with sin, the world, the flesh, and the devil, as well as the Bible also teaches us. Now, when Christ, by effectual calling, through his word and spirit, takes up residence in our soul. He doesn't take full possession or sin would be totally eradicated. That happens only at our death. But through life, the dominion of sin is no more. But its power is still present, we notice in section one. Now section two goes on to say, this sanctification is throughout in the whole man, yet imperfect in this life. There abideth still some remnants of corruption in every part, whence ariseth a continual and irreconcilable war, the flesh lusting against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. You see, section one is saying, that as a res well, say, justification says the guilt of sin is removed forever. Section one of sanctification says the absolute power and dominion of sin is destroyed forever. But section two reminds us that sin is not eradicated. And there are these remains, though it doesn't reign. And consequently, because we're new creatures in Christ who have a love for virtue, but still have the remnants of our old, unqualified love for vice, the battle royal begins at the moment of sanctification. I am, as I'm sure you are, interested in uh, uh, therapy, especially Christian therapy, and especially Christians who seek uh, uh, therapy. Some uh, psychologists and psychoanalysts and so on have suggested that evangelical Christians are almost fair game for psychological aberration. And some of them think that they are their ripest candidates for psychological problems. I don't think they're right on that, but I can see where they get the idea. Now, the Christian really does have a battle in his soul between good and evil. Before he was converted, he was a homogeneous person. He loved evil and nothing but evil. His only agonizing was choosing between one evil and another, the way Dr. Jekyll was choosing, between the evil of pride and arrogance and affluence and success and so on, which he prided as a lust of the heart, and sensuality and corruption, which he prized as a lust of the flesh. 
They were both lusts, and they were both detestable in God's eyes the way he was conducting them, but he had real agony because one lust fought against another lust. If he yielded to his sensuality, he'd lose his prestige, his success, his affluence, and so on, which he also desired. And if, on the other hand, he was going to keep on that, he had to keep this other lust. In fact, that was a real battle. Robert Louis Stevenson was writing fiction, but it was not fictional in the lives of many people, very real, but it was no struggle comparable to that of a Christian. It wasn't between vice and virtue. It was between one form of vice and another form of vice. But when a person becomes a Christian, if Dr. Jekyll ever became converted, he would actually have a fight to the death between sin and righteousness. But the point is this. The reason a Christian who will have that kind of battle that Westminster describes should never be a problem in psychological aberration unless there's some extraneous cause of it, but never from his doctrinal principles, is the fact that he knows he's redeemed in Christ, the guilt of all his sin is taken away, the power and dominion of sin is destroyed, the ultimate outcome is absolutely certain. What is there to be distressed about? Why would a person be a psychological problem? Oh, he'll fight against sin, but that fighting against sin is a sign of a new life. The very fact that he hates sin now shows he's alive in Christ. So even while he's sweating in the struggle, the very sweat is proof that there's new life in Christ. When this section two points out that this goes through all of life, you'll notice that it's answering a question which has been debated down through the ages. Does chapter seven of Romans describe the struggle of an unconverted person and chapter eight, the true life of a converted person where the battle's over and there's no condemnation to them or in Christ Jesus, not according to the Westminster Confession of Faith. A person is in chapter seven and chapter eight all his life. But what's being said here is that he's in chapter seven all his life. That is, this battle goes on until he dies. I'm adding to this what they had in mind, though they had no occasion to write it here. He's also in chapter eight in the sense that even in the middle of the battle, when he's crying out, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this remaining corruption and death and so on? He can say there is therefore now no condemnation of them who are in Christ Jesus. And the only proof that he's in Christ Jesus is he's fighting against sin. So the very fight that he has in Romans 7 is the basis for the confidence he expresses in Romans 8. So I would say, and I think the Westminster divines would say the same, a true Christian is in chapter 7 and chapter 8 of Romans all the days of his life sweating it out in the battle against sin and absolutely jubilant in the triumph that he has in Jesus Christ and the ultimate outcome of total victory for the true saint. A little chapter here on sanctification concludes with section three. In which war, it's a war, goes on through life, as section two says, although the remaining corruption for a time may much prevail, that's bad news, isn't it, for us Christians? But you knew it before I told you here. You don't have to read the Westminster Confession to know that sin sometimes awfully prevails. It's good to know that theologians who were masters of the word found it there too, and that our experience is not unusual or aberrant, however sinful it may be, and however we must conquer it, and so on. But let me read now without further comment. In which war, although the remaining corruption <clears throat> for our time may prevail, yet through the continual supply of strength from the sanctifying spirit of Christ, the regenerate part doth overcome. And so the saints grow in grace, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. That's an interesting conclusion to this section. The battle goes on through life. There are certain points, this passage says, when... Sin is momentarily uppermost, but look at the battle as a whole, and sin is being more and more subjugated in this life. It's not only that it's going to be totally eradicated at death, but even in this life, real progress is going to be made against it. At a given moment, it may look indeed 
not only as if no progress had been made, but as if the reverse direction had been taken. Here is Peter, to whom Christ can say, Blessed art thou, Simon Bar-Jonah, flesh and blood had not revealed it unto thee, but my Father who is in heaven. Here is Peter who is willing to follow Jesus to prison and to death if need be, denying three times with an oath that he even knew the man. How does the Westminster Confession put it? It says, although the remaining corruption for a time may much prevail. That was a magnificent understatement of the experience of the Apostle Peter. It did much prevail. It seemed almost totally to prevail. You know, when Jesus looked at him after he had three times denied him, Peter just broke down in tears. Oh, but sin prevailed. But nevertheless, Peter may have pl played the coward on that occasion. He died a martyr, crucified head down, not feeling fit to resemble his master even in his martyr's death. No, no. At that particular moment, sin did much prevail, but in the overall course of that Christian life, as in your Christian life or mine, progress is made and the direction is clear, becoming ever clearer of where we really are going. I get a kick out of the fact that there's a highway in northern Pennsylvania. I don't know whether it's been changed or not. This experience of mine goes back 20 years. It's Route 6, 6 West, up around Erie somewhere. That road literally turns around in a circle. And when you're on a circle heading due east for New York, not Chicago, you read a sign which says 6W. I remember the first time I saw it, I broke out laughing after my alarm was, had subsided. I was scared silly. I was on the wrong road and so on. Then I realized, no, no. Even though I momentarily am heading for New York, this road is going to take me to Chicago where I was going. And so it may well be. And as I say, at a certain, and when Peter was denying that he ever knew Jesus Christ, he was going six west to New York. If you had just judged the bent of that man's life from that one moment, you would think he was heading for hell and not for heaven. But if you looked at his life as a whole, even though there be these cool de socks, these little eddies in the stream here and there, the general movement is unmistakable. It's toward heaven. We are dying more and more to sin and living more and more to righteousness, though at a given moment it may look as if there's more sin than righteousness, in the overall movement, this is a good test of your Christianity, dear friends. You don't conclude you're not a s converted person because you're not perfect or because you have to acknowledge some dreadful lapse on an occasion. But this is what would prove you're not a Christian if Westminster's right. If the basic bent of your life is not upward. See, our problem with the perfectionist is this. They think the Christian life is like this. You become justified. You're saved. You're in. You've got the foundation. You're going to go to heaven. You may never grow in grace or anything until you have a BHS or some other sanctifying spirit. And then they suppose you come up here and you live on an entire sanctification or holiness or perfectness some form of perfection. That's not the way the Westminster Confession teaches it, and the Westminster Confession teaches it as the Bible teaches it, in my opinion. The pattern of a Christian life is not that. It is this. There is no question you're moving upward. Slowly, surely, you're moving upward. There are times when it may well look as if you have no grace in your soul, and all of you can tell, there are moments in your life when it seems that the heavens are made of brass, that your aspirations cleave to the dust. You ask yourself seriously, do I have any of the love of God in me? How could I have said the thing I said? Or do the thing I did? And really love Jesus Christ? Surely Peter, when he wept, must have wondered, how could I really ever have meant what I said when I declared I'd follow him to prison and to death and before three maids 
girls pointing a finger at me. I played an absolutely abysmal coward. How can you feel at a moment like that? Now, we'll take this subject up again when we come to assurance of salvation. But right now, we're just studying the sanctification pattern as it is uh, presented to us in the Westminster Confession of Faith. And this is what it is saying. One, two, three. One, the dominion of sin is broken in sanctification. Two, because that dominion is broken but not destroyed, there is a battle royal. Three, in that battle royal, though there will be some ghastly reverses possibly, the movement will be unmistakably upward toward Christ as we die more and more to sin and live more and more to righteousness. Now, in the next two chapters, what Westminster does is look at the basic ingredients of sanctification, which it describes generally in the terms we have just seen in chapter 13. So chapter 14 takes up saving faith, and chapter 15, repentance unto life. But now, chapter 14 of saving faith. Again, there are only three short sections, but penetrating and very meaningful ones. The grace of faith, whereby the elect are enabled to believe to the saving of their souls. And may I say in passing here, you can't help but notice throughout this document that though election is expressly stated in chapter 3, it recurs as a refrain throughout the entire creed. And that really is the basic thinking of the Bible. This is not just a doctrine that you take up under the topic of the divine decrees and dismiss it and then pay your attention to actual Christian living and so on. No, no, you gather it up. And when you're talking about sanctification, you're talking about the sanctification which the predestinated saints are living. And when you're talking about faith, you're talking about the faith which the predestinated saints are exercising. And when you're going to go to repentance, it's going to be the elect in the act of repentance and in the acts of repentance. These things are all wrapped together. Systematic theology is a single whole. It's like the undivided garment of our Lord. It is one piece, and each piece meshes with the other. And while one part may be distinguishable from another, they are all inseparable. And the Westminster divines, without making a point of that, they just illustrate the fact by the way they refer to election, which was developed in chapter 3 quite casually, as a matter of fact, because it's already been stated as a truth that's relevant to the topic under discussion. They mention it casually, as a matter of fact, here in the first section of chapter 14 on saving faith. The grace of faith, whereby the elect are enabled to believe to the saving of their souls, is the work of the Spirit of Christ in their hearts and is ordinarily enwrought by the ministry of the Word, by which also, and by the administration of the sacraments and prayer, it is increased and strengthened. It's the work of Christ, faith, justifying faith. We noticed that before, you remember, when we talked about faith bringing justification plus works, that faith itself, as was stated in the chapter in justification, is the gift of Jesus Christ. Here it's stated again when we focus on faith, not justification now, but on faith, and we say that that's inwrought by Jesus Christ, usually, always by Christ, but it also states that it's usually or ordinarily wrought by the ministry of the Word, that's the Bible, by which also, and by the administration of the sacraments and prayer. Remember, the divines have had the idea, and this is a case where I'm a little uncomfortable with them. I don't either agree or disagree with them. I notice with great respect what they say, and anything they say commands my respect, but not necessarily my agreement. They do talk, you notice. They said this about an effectual calling, and they're saying something like this once again, that while God normally, usually, ordinarily, works by means, normally the Spirit and the Word, the Spirit works when, where, and how He pleases. And in the case of infants, where He regenerates, He pleases to work without the Word, which infants, of course, cannot understand. And in the case of some persons, adult, who are outside the range of the Word, He, the Spirit, they think, may work independently of His normal means, which is the Word, which these persons did not hear and therefore could not have used in their actual conversion. 
but it's always by Christ, they're saying. It's usually by His Word and uh, the ministry of the Word and the administration of the sacraments and prayer. And it's always strengthened by prayer as well. I don't think that needs any other special comment here. Let me go on to the second and more important uh, observation concerning saving faith. By this faith, a Christian believeth to be true whatsoever is revealed in the Word, for the authority of God Himself speaking therein. That's what was stated in the very first chapter. The only reason the Bible is believed is because it's the Word of God and because of the authority of God. That's it. Period. Nothing beyond that. Not the testimony of the Word, not the experience of your heart. It's the Word of God, and because it's the Word of God, because of His inherent authority, it's to be believed and for no other reason than that. And so here, the authority of God speaking therein, and acting differently upon that which each particular passage thereof containeth. Our faith acts differently with respect to every passage in the Scripture. Now that, you will admit, is an unusual comment, isn't it? And we're interested to see what the divines say by way of explanation of that rather surprising declaration that the Spirit works differently with respect to each passage and our faith operates differently with respect to each passage. Yielding, ah, here comes the explanation, yielding obedience to the commands, see there are commands in the Bible, they require obedience, trembling at the threatenings, there are threatenings in the Bible, and because the Bible is the Word of God, threatens, threatenings produce their proper response, which is terror. Trembling at the threatenings and embracing the promises of God for this life. Promises, of course, are most welcome, and the thing you do with promises is hug them, take them, rejoice in them, revel in them, and so on. So you obey commands, you tremble at threatenings, and you embrace promises for this life and for that which is to come. That God makes a promise for us even in our earthly pilgrimage and an incomparable promise in the world to come. And the only proper response, dear Christian friends, is embracing it. It's a promise. God has made it. It's good as done. I'm just as certain of heaven now as when I get there. I can't possibly be any more certain than the Word of God can make me or you, can it? If God says it's going to be, it's going to be. I don't have to wait around. I'm not going to be a bit more certain when it happens than I am now. If God says it, if you said it, I wouldn't be sure. You might be the most honest person possible, but I know you are not necessarily capable of carrying out your promises to me. So I'll thank you if you make me a good promise and so on. I'll believe you because you're you, a finite person who may not be able to carry out his promises, you see. But if these are the promises of God, oh, there's no room for doubt. He is able to do what he says he will do. And if he says he's going to bless me, I know he's going to bless me. If he says he's going to take away my sin forever and death, I know, and I don't have to wait till I die. That that's going to happen. You see, this is, what, uh, this is the way faith operates according to we have a gravely mower, which I'm not advertising crazy things and so on, but it has an interesting advertisement that it follows the contours of the ground. You know, we've got some very rough ground where that gravely of ours goes and so on. It goes up and down along with the way. And in the same way with faith. Faith responds to the ground, to the type of biblical passage it's resting on at that particular moment. It trembles, it obeys, it rejoices, as the case may be. But the principal acts of saving faith are accepting, receiving, and resting upon Christ alone for justification, sanctification, and eternal life by virtue of the covenant of grace. There is a section which follows, but you hardly need to add anything to that, and we certainly will not do so at this time.